Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to uh, Psychiatry Grand Rounds. Uh, my name is Tony Rothschild. I'm the chair of the Grand Rounds Committee. I want to welcome you to the semi-annual Al Gruzinskis Lecture in Law and Psychiatry, and the lecture is named after a, our beloved uh, faculty uh, member. A couple of brief announcements. To receive credit for attending today's Grand Rounds, complete the um, uh, evaluation, which came with a Survey Monkey link with the announcement from Karen Lambert on Monday. We are going to be having Zoom, uh, I'm sorry, we're going to be having Grand Rounds on Zoom for the rest of the academic year, but we are planning on doing this in person um, in September, although it will still be available on Zoom. If you have questions for today's speaker, please type them in the chat and we will ask the speaker the questions at the end of his talk. Next week's Grand Rounds on April 14th will be given by uh, Dr. Jeffrey Bostic, who is a child psychiatrist at Georgetown University Hospital. And the title of Dr. Bostic's talk next week is Clinical Applications of Well-Being Practices. It's my pleasure uh, to introduce Dr. Gina Vinson, the co-director of the Law and Psychiatry Program, who will introduce today's speaker. Gina. Thank you, Tony. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Grand Rounds and our special Al Gruzinskis Memorial Lecture. For those of you who would have never met Al, he was an attorney very heavily engaged in mental health law back when he started at UMass, which I believe was in the late 1990s. It was before my time. Um, and he eventually became an associate professor. He always referred to himself as the law in our law and psychiatry program because he was our JD. He was responsible for training many forensic postdoc fellows in case law every week for the year that they were here. He was also heavily engaged in um, mental health training of police, uh, laws affecting sex offenders, and many other areas of expertise that affect forensic psychiatry and psychology. And for those of us who remember him, um, for many of, the, many of the faculty, they would tell you that despite his crazy schedule, he was always incredibly willing to give us legal advice, both personally and professionally, and he was always very giving of his time and himself. He was a wonderful person. Um, and there is no better person to be inviting for this lecture today uh, than Christopher Slobogan. And I'll just tell you a little bit about him and pass it over, but Chris is one of the very few JDs and possibly the most influential JD I know who has been so heavily engaged in forensic psychiatry and psychology practice. He's advanced our field tremendously by his writing and multiple presentations, both nationally and internationally, on areas such as culpability, dangerousness and risk assessment, sentencing, juvenile justice laws, mental health law. I think I saw some stuff about death penalty in his CV, and it goes on and on. I can tell you um, that he is a co-author of the foundational text that any of us who are trained in forensic psychology had as our main reading material, and that is Psychological Evaluations for the Courts, a handbook for mental health professionals and lawyers. Um, he's also one of the few JDs who's been heavily engaged with the American Psychology Law Society and forensic psychology in general. He is an editor of Behavioral Sciences and the Law, um, and he has just been very engaged in all of our practice. He's currently uh, Milton R. Underwood Chair in Law, Director of the Criminal Justice Program and Affiliate Professor of Psychiatry at Vanderbilt Law School. Um, he has both a JD and an LLM, which I had to look up. That's a Master of Laws degree, and he received both of those from the University of Virginia Law School. He has received multiple teaching awards. He has written multiple monographs. I think I, they're not numbered in his CV, but over 100 law review articles dating back to 1980. Um, he is very well known nationally and internationally, and we are delighted that he accepted our invitation today. And he's going to be speaking to you all about a jurisprudence of risk. Thank, Thank you, you Gina. Uh, I indeed was very oops, sorry. I was uh, very delighted to receive this invitation. I'm very glad to be here. I think it's appropriate, as Gina said, that I'm doing the Augustinskis lecture since. I do law. Um, I like to pretend I'm a psychologist. Uh, and in fact, some of my favorite people are psychologists. And I actually enjoy going to APLS more than going to your typical law conference, but I am a lawyer. Uh, I want to make that clear from the get-go. 
Um, I'm going to be talking about risk assessment uh, primarily. I know a lot of you do risk assessment. A lot of you do not. Uh, but I'm hoping what will occur during this talk is um, some, some perspective. What will hopefully will give you some perspective on what the law's approach is to risk assessment. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the empirical basis of risk assessment. I'm going to focus on the legal analysis of risk assessment. Um, but in the course of doing that, I think it will provide you with some food for thought on the kinds of things you do, especially in the forensic area, but also in other areas. Now, most of what I'm going to be talking about is going to come from this book, Just Algorithms Using Science to Reduce Incarceration and Inform a Jurisprudence of Risk, which came out last year. And the reason I wrote this book, and the reason I use this title of Jurisprudence of Risk, is because I've always been irritated that the law has spent so little time thinking about risk. Um, I teach at a law school, I teach criminal law, and I can tell you there are literally hundreds of thousands of pages written on the jurisprudence of culpability, on what lawyers call actus reus and mens rea, on the meaning of blameworthiness, on how they define crime and how they define criminal defenses. But very little has been written about risk about prediction, about dangerousness. Uh, in fact, the issue has pretty much been ignored altogether. And I think that's been an abdication of responsibility by the courts and by legal academics because risk is routinely relied on in the criminal and civil justice systems um, as a justification for deprivation of liberty, uh, among other things. And so I think it's incumbent on the legal system to spend more time thinking about a jurisprudence of risk, but I'm calling it a jurisprudence of risk. Now, in fairness to scholars and courts and legislatures, until relatively recently, um, it was not easy to say much about a jurisprudence of risk that could be concrete. And the reason for that is risk assessment was primarily clinical in nature, uh, and therefore there was not much for the law to sink its teeth into. Uh, there had been very little research done on risk assessment, very little research done on risk factors, but today, of course, as many of you know, we have risk assessment instruments, either actuarial or structured professional judgment instruments um, that help us say something much more concrete about risk and risk assessment. Um, and these kinds of instruments are used in a number of states, uh, uh, sometimes in civil commitment, sometimes in pretrial detention decision making sometimes it's sentencing. I'm going to be focusing almost entirely on the sentencing process, risk assessment in the sentencing process. Um, and what I'm going to, again, try to do is be more precise about what a jurisprudence of risk can be. And I think I can do that because of risk assessments, because they give us some actual statistical information about risk that we did not have before. Now, the other thing I want to talk about today are some of the controversies over risk assessment instruments. Uh, and they are very controversial. They've been uh, described as, to put it bluntly, antithetical to the entire criminal justice system and the fundamental values of the criminal justice system. Uh, they've also been called dehumanizing uh, and they've been called racist. So I want to spend some time talking about <clears throat> those criticisms in the course of this talk. But first, I want to talk about the role that risk currently plays in the criminal justice system, and particularly at sentencing. Um, so every state declares in its legislation that protecting the public, prevention of harm to others is a singular goal of government. And it's certainly the primary goal or a primary goal of sentencing. So one would think that trying to figure out which offenders are the most dangerous or the highest risk, highest risk would be one of the preeminent goals of the criminal justice system, if not a society more generally. Um, however, as I'll talk about more later, but I wanna flag right now, many scholars, and I think some judges and some legislators uh, believe along with people like Andrew Von Hirsch, that it's immoral. It's immoral to base any sentence on risk, on what a person might do in the future. And following that line of reasoning, Many states have adopted what's called determinate sentencing. Beginning in the 1970s, in particular, we had a number of states adopting what has been called determinate sentencing. Um, and those sentences presumably or supposedly don't, don't 
consider risk at all. They're not based on risk at all. Uh, they're supposed to be based entirely on a backward looking assessment of a person's culpability, on the culpability of their criminal act, or on what some theorists call retribution or just desert. Um, however, it's also important to note that this determinate sentencing approach is not required. Supreme Court's held that it's constitutionally permissible to base sentences on risk. And in fact, in the Jurek case that you see cited here, it held that a death sentence can be based solely on a finding of dangerousness, a finding of risk. Um, and many states still permit explicit consideration of risk, either at sentencing at the front end or during uh, the parole process. Um, and that's often called indeterminate sentencing. And then there is sort of the in-between approach, a uh, sentencing that occurs in a number of states is based on a mix of factors. Most popular is what is sometimes called limiting retributivism. Um, and this type of sentencing regime, culpability or desert considerations set the range of the sentence, say two to five years or five to 15 years. And other factors such as risk and maybe general deterrence and other considerations determine the precise length of the sentence. So the newly adopted uh, and really influential Model Penal Code sentencing provision, that's what MPC stands for, Model Penal Code, came out in 2017. Uh, they adopt this so-called limiting retributivism approach to sentencing. So those are the approaches to sentencing and the role that risk plays in the various states. So why might we want to consider risk? Why might it be good to go with approach number two or three as opposed to determinate sentencing? Um, well, one reason, and the reason I give as the primary reason in my book, is that we got a huge, a huge mass incarceration problem. And it may be that assessments of risk can help us deal with that. And here are some of the numbers. You're probably familiar with this. Back in the 1970s, before we went to determinate sentencing, by the way, um, the incarceration rate was what you see here, about 96 people per 100,000. Today, it's over 600 people per 100,000. So the incarceration rate has gone up sixfold in just the last 50 years. So we've got about 2 million people in jails and prisons today. And this is incredibly expensive. Um, $70 billion a year of direct cost, about $500 billion a year in indirect cost. Um, to get another perspective on incarceration in our country and what it's like compared to other countries, here's the U.S. imprisonment rate and the European imprisonment rate. The European rate is one-sixth of the American rate. And by the way, European rate includes the rate in Eastern European countries, which tend to be tougher on crime. So there are a lot of people on both the left and the right who think this is a major problem and we need to do something about it. We need to reduce incarceration rates if we can do so. And there have been a number of reforms proposed, like decriminalization, um, alternatives to prison, and so on. But as Michael here, among many other people, have pointed out, most of these reforms aren't doing much. Why? Because they aim at the low-hanging fruit. They aim at people charged with nonviolent felonies, minor crimes, most of whom don't spend much time in prison at all if they go to prison. Uh, and, these, and many of the other reforms, to the extent they try to get at something more serious, give decision makers like judges and pro boards a lot of discretion, meaning they can just bypass um, any attempt to reduce incarceration because they have so much discretion. Um, so the reforms to date haven't been able to do much. Um, and I think partly that's because, again, the discretion that I described earlier, the reforms give decision makers a lot of discretion. So what do they do? Anyone they perceive to be risky, uh, they don't release they imprison and those people spend the maximum or close to the maximum amount of time in prison that is allowed by the legislature. Uh, but in fact, as many of you probably know, most people who have offended are not likely to again commit serious crimes. Um, they might commit, they might recidivate in some way, but not commit serious crimes. In fact, the base rate, according to uh, Bureau of Justice Statistics data, is about 30 percent for very serious offenses like homicide, um, aggravated assault, rape, and robbery. And if that's true, uh, then if we could devise some way, if we're going to, what that 30% is, we might be able to reduce large numbers of people uh, from prison much earlier than they are currently released and 
thus reduce incarceration rates and perhaps also reduce incarceration costs. And I think if we could do this, the public would be on board. I mean, there are a number of polls that um, find what this Wisconsin poll did. The reason I have this Wisconsin poll summarized here is I think most people would call Wisconsin a purple state. And yet, even in this purple state, people were, were willing to say they'd be willing to cut sentences of violent offenders, not just nonviolent offenders, but violent offenders by 50%, if there could be some kind of um, guarantee that most of them would not reoffend. And back before the 1970s, that's pretty much what we did. Pro boards were trying to figure out who was high risk, who was low risk, and people who were considered low risk were being released. Granted, some of them would be offend, but on the whole, we had much lower incarceration rates when the entire country went with indeterminate sentencing and parole board decision making. But with determinate sentencing, and even in the hybrid states, much less discretion given to parole boards, all of that's pretty much gone by the wayside. So I'm arguing for a move back in that direction with the one difference in particular, using risk assessments to help us decide um, who is high risk and who isn't. Um, and that gets me to risk assessments. Um, if we are going to more clearly base decision making and sentencing on risk, um, I argue in the book that we ought to use risk assessment instruments. And I argue that based on research that shows that, generally speaking, risk assessment instruments, which I'm going to call RAIs for the most part during this talk, RIIs produce more accurate judgments than traditional clinical assessments. That's been a finding over and over again. I do want to mention, though, one study that seemed to find otherwise. Some of you may know about the study. Uh, it's by Farrad and Dressel. It got a whole lot of press back in 2019. It purported to find um, that lay people could do just as well as one of the more widely used risk assessment instruments in figuring out who was high risk. That was the finding they reported. Um, but there was a subsequent analysis and study done by Lynn et al., which undercut the Farrad and Dressel study significantly. Because what Lynn et al. pointed out is that the way Fred and Dressel implemented their study is they would give the lay people only a limited number of facts, the same kinds of facts an algorithm would give a decision maker. Um, and they were facts that were statistically related to us. And that's all the lay people got. And then after every single decision they made, they were given feedback on whether they're right or wrong. So basically the lay people in the study were converted into human algorithms. They basically were functioning like human algorithms. And in fact, in the Lynn study, um, which replicated the study, but this time did not limit the amount of information the lay people got. And in fact, gave them other additional information that created a lot of noise. Um, the lay people didn't know better than chance. In, in other words, they were horrible at, at doing risk assessments, which I think, again, um, undercut this Fred and Dressel study, which, again, got a lot of press, which is why I'm spending so much time on it. And I think it's, very, it's a very misleading study in terms of actual versus other kinds of decision making about risk. Um, but even if actual instruments are the preferable way. And when I say actual, I mean REIs generally. I include structured professional judgment in, in that um, rubric. Even if they are a better way of assessing risk, um, I think we got, need to make sure that the instruments we're using are good instruments. They're good at assessing risk. And that's why I think we need a jurisprudence of risk that tells people like you all uh, how to develop risk assessment instruments, how to use them, in a way that makes them useful to the legal system. And so what I do in the book is I talk about three different principles that ought to apply to risk assessment. I call them the FIP principle, um, which has to do with how we define risk, the validity principle, which has to do with accuracy, and the fairness principle, which gets to, uh, gets to um, justice issues, um, the kinds of issues I alluded to earlier. And so, to talk about these principles, I want to, first of all, acquaint those of you who are not acquainted with them with some uh, risk assessment instruments. I know some of this is going to be uh, old hat to those of you who do risk assessment, but I think it's useful even for those of you who know about risk assessment and risk assessment instruments to be reminded about what some of them look like. So here's the BRAG. I know a lot of you know about this, um, and this is actually probably an older version of the BRAG, but for present purposes, I think it, it fits the bill. You can see here it has 12 risk factors, uh, 
the score on the psychopathy checklist, which is, of course is a measure of psychopathy, uh, school misconduct, uh, DSM diagnosis, uh, age at the time of the triggering offense, what was going on with the family before age 16, and a number of other factors that have to do with antisocial behavior. And then you see the weights given these factors, the points are added up, uh, and then people after the points are added up are put in one of nine categories, and you see here are two of them. So if you get a score of zero to six, uh, you're in a group, 35% of whom recidivated, 35% or so recidivated within seven years. I think now the follow-up period in the BRAG is five years, but again, this is just um, a heuristic that helps you understand what risk assessment's like using these instruments. If a person gets a score of 21 to 27, uh, they fit in a group, 75% of whom recidivated within the follow-up period. Um, here's another look at the BRAG. You can see here at the bottom, can you see my cursor? Um, you see here at the bottom, the percentage of people in the sample that are in each bin. So the highest risk category, um, only 1% are in it. Uh, the next highest risk, only 2%. Most of the folks are in categories that fall in the lower bins and the lower risk categories. And I think that's important to understand. But this is uh, gives you a sense of what the outcomes to the VRAG look like. I'm gonna come back to this later. Uh, this is another risk assessment instrument. Uh, it's very well known, it's the Compass. It's, it's gotten a lot of press. It's very controversial. That's why I'm telling you about it in case you didn't know about it. Uh, that stands for, um, hold it, I gotta look it up. The Correctional Offender Management Profiling for Alternative Sanctions uh, instrument. That's what Compass stands for. And it provides um, uh, various ratings and the kinds of areas you see here, criminal involvement, relationships, personality, and so on. And then, um, it ends up deriving a violence recidivism risk score, a general recidivism risk score, pretrial risk score, um, in terms of deciles that you see here. Um, one thing about the compass, which I'll come back to, is we don't know, unlike with the VRAG, we don't know the precise factors, risk factors that are in the compass or the weights assigned those risk factors, um, because the company won't tell us what they are. The company that developed the compass won't tell us what they are. Uh, here's a third risk assessment instrument, and all of you, I think, that do forensic work know about this one, the ECR 20. It looks at 20 factors, 10 historical, five clinical, five having to do with risk management. Um, and you can see what the factors are here. Uh, one thing I want to emphasize, because I'm going to come back to it, is a lot of these factors are not historical, but rather they're dynamic. In other words, they're factors that conceivably could be changed through treatment or in other ways, like lack of insight, negative attitudes, active symptoms of major mental illness, unfeasibility of plans, and so on. So, um, though, and I guess one thing I should point out with the ACR 20 that's also relevant to what I'm gonna say later is, is people are told in the instruction manual uh, not to come up with precise probabilities, rather just to say whether a person based on the analysis is high, medium, or low risk, uh, but there's no definition of what high, medium, or low means, and it, Research has shown that different evaluators mean very different things when they say high, medium, or low. So some researchers have tried to associate uh, scores on the VREG. What you can do is score each one of these factors, zero, one, or two, so the maximum score would be 40. And doing that, uh, researchers have associated a score of one to 14 with about a 11% chance of recidivating within two years. And you see here also the recidivism rate associated with a score of over 35. So you can sort of convert the ACR20 into an actuarial-like device um, if you want to. Um, so those are three RAIs. Um, and with those RAIs in mind, I now want to turn to this jurisprudence of risk that I allude to in the title of my book, which I think the legal system's not done a very good job of developing. Um, and again, what I'm talking about here is something analogous to what we do with culpability. So I said, thousands of pages have been spent on the elements of crime, actress raised and men's rate, or the elements of self-defense, the elements of the insane defense. We don't have anything like that in the risk area. And so I think we should have elements of risk. And I think the elements should be four. The, uh, the, the policymakers, as it says here, should clarify what probability of what outcome during what time period in the absence of what intervention justifies a sense enhancement or whatever the law is interested in doing. Um, and I'm gonna now for the next 10 minutes castigate the law for not doing a very good job with any of these criteria. 
So here's the probability criterion or what I'm going to say about it. And I'm going to use Texas as sort of my foil because Texas is particularly bad at all of this. But I think what I say about Texas is more or less true of all states. And I'm going to focus on the Texas death penalty statute because obviously a huge amount is at stake in death penalty cases. And yet the law has done a particularly egregious job in defining what it means by probability. You see here the definition of an aggravating factor in the Texas death penalty statute. It's a probability that the individual will commit criminal acts of violence that constitute a continuing threat to society. If the jury finds this is true, they can impose the death penalty on an individual, okay? Uh, the Texas courts over and over again have refused to define the word probability. They won't say this means more likely or not. They won't say what it means. Um, if there were a jurisprudence of risk, they would have to, to uh, define this. I mean, they do that with actus raised and mens rea. They should have to do it with risk as well. And so, for instance, if they define probability as a 51% chance of recidivating, and they had to prove that probability beyond a reasonable doubt, that's what BRD stands for, which might be quantified in 95% chance of uh, uh, 95% probability. If you do the math, that ends up being about a 45% rate of reoffending. Now, that's very quantified, and some lawyers, of course, hate math and think we shouldn't be doing this kind of thing, but it does give us something concrete to focus on. It forces the courts to make a normative judgment about the risk that needs to be associated with putting someone to death. So go back to the BRAC. If 45% were the probability that has to be shown, that would exclude 75% of the sample because with 45% being the threshold, if you add up the percentages, 12, 25, 22, 18, and 10, that's a huge percentage of the typical sample of people, at least according to the BRAG validation samples uh, studies. So that would mean a very small proportion of people evaluated under the BRAG um, would meet the Texas aggravator um, criterion. Um, so that's the first criterion, and probably the proportion of people on the VRAG who might come close to being considered high risk would be reduced even further if courts took seriously the second criterion, the outcome criterion. Um, what am I talking about here? Well, here on the, I'm going to use the Texas statute as an example again. A probability of what? leads to the imposition of death penalty. A probability of criminal acts of violence. That's the outcome variable. Well, what does that mean? Well, once again, the Texas courts have told us nothing about what violence means, which I think is egregious. I think it's amazing the Texas courts have not done that. Um, I think, in fact, it's unconstitutional to fail to define what this means. Um, and I base that, if, the lawyerly phrase is it's void for vagueness. Now, it is true that in the Jurek case, the Supreme Court held this language is not void for vagueness, but that was a long time ago. Since then, the Supreme Court of the United States has decided the Johnson case, which dealt with a statute that used the word violence. It was actually a statute that dealt with enhancing sentences for violent offenders. And the Supreme Court in Johnson said use of the word violence in this statute was unconstitutionally vague. Because as used in the statute, or as, as, because it was undefined, it could include crimes like tampering with juries or failing to adhere to a red light signal or crimes like attempted burglary. And the Supreme Court said, you can't enhance a person's sentence based on a term that could be defined so broadly, that is so vague. So I think basically Johnson over, overturns Jurek. And I think now the constitutional argument is pretty strong that failure to define risk of what, in this case, risk of violence, is unconstitutional. And I want to stress this point. Without RAIs, it's very difficult to make the kind of argument I'm making. Without RAIs, we can't be more precise about what probability means or more precise about what the outcome variable is. Um, the same thing is true with the third variable, the duration variable. Um, because I think the law also ought to say a probability of what outcome within what time period. So I've been focusing mostly on sentencing, but let's talk about pretrial detention for a second. If we're talking about pretrial detention, what should be the durational period? 
Well, three to six months. That's all we care about because a person's trial will take place, usually under the Speedy Trial Act, within six months. Yet most of the risk assessment instruments that are used at the pretrial setting, for instance, the Compass, have a two-year follow-up period. If I'm a lawyer, I argue that that is, makes the risk assessment instrument irrelevant. The follow-up period should be three months to six months. If the sentence the maximum period for a particular sentence is three years, then something like the VRAG, the follow-up period for which is seven years, um, arguably is irrelevant. The VRAG should be irrelevant because its follow-up period was seven years, whereas the maximum sentence a person could be given, let's say, in a given case is three years. So again, risk assessment instruments allow us to be more precise about what we mean by risk. And by the way, I want to go back just for a second to the outcome variable, which, and I think um, if I can, I'm not sure I can. Um, well, I can't, so that's okay. I'll just continue on uh, with the final criterion, the intervention criterion. And this one, in many ways, is the most important because, of course, even people who are high risk don't necessarily need to go to prison. There are interventions short of prison that could conceivably reduce risk. And I know a lot of you deal with this kind of situation through risk management. And here, I think the most important legal decision is Jackson versus Indiana, which dealt with an individual who had been found incompetent to proceed and uh, was put in a hospital after a finding of incompetency. And three years later, was found by a lawyer who brought the suit that resulted in Jackson where the court said, you can't keep a person in detained forever. Um, you have to make attempts to restore the person to competency. The more general principle that the court came up with is what you see here, that the nature and duration of confinement must bear a reasonable relationship to its purpose. Well, what is the purpose of confinement we're talking about here? Prevention, right? The state, when it's looking at risk, uh, is trying to implement uh, uh, the, the purpose of prevention. And what Jackson, to me, stands for is three separate propositions, first of, of which is that if the goal is prevention, the state must try to achieve that goal in the least drastic way possible. Again, the nature and purpose of confinement must bear a reasonable relationship to its purpose. So if the purpose is prevention, it's incumbent upon the state to not go with prison from the get-go there might be less restrictive ways of dealing with a person's risk. And of course, there are lots of different ways of dealing with risk. A treatment program in the community, a vocational treatment program, a job release program, there are lots of different ways, short of prison, that might be able to deal with risk. So that's one proposition that I think Jackson um, stands for. Another is that treatment has to be provided. If prevention is the goal and treatment can reduce a person's risk, then as a constitutional matter, treatment has to be provided. I think this is very important because right now there's no constitutional right to treatment in prison. Um, if you're in a determined sentencing regime, there's no constitutional right to treatment, but there would be in a prevention oriented regime where risk is the government's goal. And in fact, there's some Supreme Court decisions like Kansas versus Hendricks and Sinning versus Young that state that in a prevention-oriented regime, there does have to be attempts to provide treatment. It may be that treatment doesn't work, but there at least has to be attempts to provide treatment. Available treatment has to be provided as a constitutional matter. Um, so that's a second proposition that Jackson stands for. And then the third proposition is, and I think it's an important one, again, that the longer you can find someone based on a determination of risk, the more risk you have to show. Just like if we're basing a sentence on culpability, you have to show, uh, and it's a long sentence, it has to be hyper culpability, it has to be significant culpability. If you keep a person detained for a long time based on risk, the longer you do that, the more risk you have to show. And if it's a very low risk individual, probably prison is totally inappropriate from the get-go. This could be called a risk proportionality idea. So I've said a lot very quickly, but this is in summary what I think the FIT principle would describe and require. And I think it would put a number of constraints 
on the kinds of risk assessment instruments that the law could use. But again, I think without risk assessment instruments, it would be very hard to impose any of these principles um, on risk assessment because clinical risk assessment doesn't provide us with the concrete information we need to figure out probability, outcome, duration, and intervention um, issues. So that's the FIT principle. Uh, moving to the validity principle, and I'm going to try to end in about 20 minutes, so um, there's time for some questions. Uh, moving to the validity principle, which is the second of the three that I want to talk about. Um, you're all familiar, I think, with Daubert, um, and maybe familiar with the Federal Rules of Evidence, which under Rule 702 um, require that expert evidence be reliable. Um, some of you may know uh, about the case of uh, Barefoot versus Estelle, which involved Dr. James Grigson, um, who was uh, testifying, who testified routinely in capital punishment cases, often to the effect that he was 100% sure a person would recidivate. Um, to me, this kind of testimony is obscene. It should never have been allowed. It should not have been allowed under Daubert, which, again, I think many of you know, requires that expert testimony have an addition of reliability, that there be error rates, that there be some indication that the basis of the expert testimony has been verified in some scientific way. Unfortunately, a number of courts have held that even though Daubert does apply at trial, it doesn't apply at sentencing uh, because by fiat, the court said, hey, it's a case about evidence. The rules of evidence don't necessarily apply at sentencing. Uh, to be blunt about it, I think, that's a very strange outcome. Daubert dealt with tort litigation. Um, and if Daubert applies in a tort suit, it certainly ought to apply in a proceeding like the death penalty proceeding where a person could be put to death or in other kinds of sentencing proceedings where years can be added to a person's sentence. So I think Daubert should apply. But even if Daubert doesn't apply, um, I think that the courts need to in some way make sure that sentences are reliable. Here you see a, a picture of Dr. Gregson. Um, I'm going to again use Texas courts as a foil over and over again, despite what I just got to saying about Daubert and the need for reliability. Texas courts have said the kind of testimony that Dr. Gregson gave, he doesn't testify anymore, but what he used to do was perfectly permissible. Um, and one rationale for that uh, came in, in NL versus State, the case you see cited here, where the court said, hey, risk assessment's a soft science. Um, so we're not gonna impose uh, Daubert and the kinds of rules we'd usually apply to hard science. And so for instance, in Neno, the court allowed an expert witness to testify based on a clinical assessment of risk. Uh, and he said, well, I'm good at this because hey, in my experience, I've done this over and over again and I know what I'm doing. Of course, he had no data to show whether or not what he was saying was reliable, but the court let him do it anyway because it's a soft science that we can't really evaluate. And in the Fifth Circuit opinion you see here, Johnson versus Cockrell, the court said, yes, that's true. And in fact, from now on, any defense attorney who brings the kind of argument that was brought in Neno, that is that we need to apply Daubert, will be rejected as frivolous. So the Texas courts have doubled down on the idea that uh, this kind of testimony and should not be subjected to Daubert analysis. Well, in case you can't guess, I think that's ridiculous. Uh, and it's especially ridiculous because now, to beat a dead horse, we have risk assessment instruments, which clearly are a form of hard science. It's totally wrong to say that risk assessment is a soft science. We can generate error rates. We can generate information about what I've got here on this slide. And I'm not going to go over this, I think, in detail. I think those of you who do this kind of stuff know what this is referring to. I think the courts need to consider uh, how well the instrument's calibrated, how well it discriminates, that is, uh, differentiates high risk from low risk of uh, individuals, uh, how well um, it is validated on local populations. Uh, it needs, the courts need to look at inter-rater agreement. Uh, and re on reliability, it needs to look at reliability. And it, these risk assessments need to be updated on a periodic basis. And then um, at the proceeding in question, the courts need to make sure that the instrument is used properly. So this is what I think the courts need to do under Daubert. 
Um, I have three, I'm not going to go over this in detail, like I said, but I have three things to say about these six factors generally. Um, the first is um, that, as I've said already, but I want to emphasize, I think with the advent of risk assessments, this is all doable. Without risk assessments, it's a lot harder to evaluate this. With risk assessments and, and statistical information, this is all doable. So the court should do it. Um, second point I want to make is the first five of these are all general issues. That is, once you've decided that an instrument is, is well calibrated, has good discriminative validity, and so on, you can use it in any case within the jurisdiction. You don't have to relitigate these issues every single time the instrument's used. And that's good. It relieves the courts and parole boards of the huge burden of having to do this over and over again. The only thing that has to be litigated in every case is number six, whether the evaluator appropriately assessed whether this particular individual had the relevant risk factors and whether the weights were added up correctly and so on and so forth. I, I, so I think that's a very important point. And the third point I wanna make is again with respect to factor six, which is this, um, that I think, and this is controversial, but I'm gonna state it and see what you all think. I think that if the instrument does well on the first five, that it ought to be presumptive. The, uh, it ought to be treated presumptively. It ought to be dispositive on the issue of risk, unless there are very good reasons for not relying on it. And I stress the word very good because a lot of research, including what you see here, has indicated when, that when evaluators adjust the result of a risk assessment instrument, they make things worse. They actually make things less accurate. Now I know that it's the human urge to always adjust. Well, yeah, the actual instrument tells me some stuff, but I know better what's going on in an individual case. Well, I think there's a lot of research to suggest otherwise. And so again, unless there's a very good reason for adjusting the results of the risk assessment instrument, um, I don't think there should be uh, an adjustment. That's what the first two words of my title refer to in part, just algorithms. Literally, we should just rely on algorithms. Um, the second meaning of that title gets to the other meaning of just, which gets to the final principle I wanna talk about, the, what I call the fairness principle. Because gotta recognize that even if a risk assessment instrument has good fit, it meets all the fit criteria I talked about. And even if it's relatively valid, it meets all the validity requirements that I've talked about, there are other controversies associated with risk assessment instruments. And I've highlighted a couple of them here. I think the most amazing one is that in 2019, over 2,500 academics demanded that that should say Springer. The Springer Publishing Company uh, issue is uh, stop publishing anything, article or book, that in any way advocated for the use of of statistics in the criminal justice system. Basically, should not publish anything about risk assessment or anything else related to the use of statistics in the criminal justice system. That's how avidly hostile a lot of people are to risk assessment instruments. And there are a number of books that take the same line. Um, well, of course, I don't agree with these kinds of positions. On the other hand, I will admit there's something to these criticisms. I, I think they should be taken with a grain of salt, but there certainly is something to these criticisms. And I break them down into three different kinds of criticisms, what I call the egalitarian injustice criticism, the retributive injustice criticism, and the procedural justice in criticism. Uh, criticism. So um, what do I mean by these? Well, the egalitarian injustice criticism basically has to do with race. Um, and this is a claim that's made <clears throat> over and over again, if you look at the algorithm literature, and I'm not here just talking about risk assessment, any use of algorithms anywhere is often criticized as racist. Um, <clears throat> and I think um, it's a very important to address this claim. Um, it's boiled down to this, it boils down to this, um, whether or not our AIs, produce racially disparate impacts. Um, and 
it's a complicated debate, but I think it could be summarized in the way you see here. The debate is about whether we should aim at good predictive validity, that is equal risk for equal risk scores across races, or instead should aim for racial equity. That is the same false positive and fa same false negative rates for uh, black people and white people. Um, and this debate was highlighted by an article in ProPublica, which I'm sure many of you heard about. Um, here's what ProPublica found using data from uh, use of the compass. And you notice here that the false positive rate for black people is higher than the false positive rate, and that it's reversed for false negative rates. And this is what the criticism was, that these rates should be the same for blacks and whites. Um, that's the racial equity position. Now, the developers of the compass did not dispute this data. They said, yeah, that's basically right. But they said, look, we were going after predictive validity. We wanted people who have the same risk scores to fit into groups <clears throat> that have the same recidivism rates, regardless of skin color. And they also argued, they pointed out, that if the crime rate for black people is higher than the crime rate for white people, which the data showed it was, you're inevitably going to have this result. The reason being that a well-calibrated risk assessment instrument um, will classify a greater proportion of black defendants as high risk if, in fact, black uh, people offend at a higher rate. Um, and by the way, the same thing would happen um, with young people and males. Um, young people and males recidivate and offend at a higher rate than older people and women. So if those are risk factors in an algorithm, you're going to have a higher false positive rate for young people than for older people, a higher false positive rate for males than for females, it's if for, than for females. It's inevitable as a statistical matter that this is going to occur. So again, it's a complicated argument, but that's the gist of it. And I argue in my book that the developers of the compass were right, and ProPublica is taking the wrong approach to this, that what we should aim for is good predictive validity, equal score, equal risk, for equal scores. But I also say in the book that this predicate to the argument, and that is that black uh, crime rates are higher than white crime rates, is problematic, and for reasons you can probably guess. Um, the criminal justice system and society generally uh, has racially disparate impacts, um, often summarized with the phrase structural racism. And I think this is a very real problem in our society and one of the arguments against the algorithms is that the algorithms reinforce the structural racism of society because the data that's in these algorithms is produced by society that is uh, fundamentally racist. At least that's the argument. Um, and so one solution to that is abolition, not just abolition of RAIs, but getting rid of the entire system. And you probably seen these arguments, I've certainly seen them in academia, that we should get rid of prisons, we should get rid of police and so on. I think it's something that should be considered, but I don't think it's gonna happen anytime in the near future. Um, but I think something short of that, focused entirely on RAIs as opposed to the rest of the system, um, is that we could spend a little bit more time thinking about outcome measures. Um, so for instance, given the impact of racialized policing, it's possible that an RAI that purports to predict arrests as opposed to convictions for any crime as opposed to serious crime seriously mis misrepresents how often people of color actually engage in the type of crime that should be of interest to the legal system. Um, it's, it's very possible that RAIs merely report how often people are arrested for petty crimes, which could often be the result of biased and discriminatory police decisions. So uh, Sandra Mason tells an interesting story that sort of, I think, brings home this point. She was a public defender in New Orleans, and she said that, hey, if a black person has three arrests, no big deal. If a white person has three arrests, that's really bad news. And I think that brings home the point that we may need to think very seriously about the outcome measures we use when we're assessing risk. So um, one thing we could do I'm sorry, for some reason I can't reverse on this and I'm, I'm trying to do so, but I can't. One thing we could do is use different outcome measures and for instance, not use serious, uh, excuse me, not use petty arrest and arrest for petty crimes uh, as an outcome measure. Um, 
However, it also is possible that that alone won't do enough. And for instance, what we see here is the fact that at least with the compass, um, calibration was not very good for the medium risk group when we're dealing with people of Hispanic origin. You notice here that calibration um, is very different for Hispanics as opposed to white people in the medium risk range. And the same thing is true uh, on the compass with respect to gender once you get to the higher risk categories. That uh, calibration is very poor with respect to women uh, when you get to higher risk categories. So another possible solution um, is to have separate algorithms for different races and different genders. That might be one way of dealing with this issue. Um, now, there are other ways too. Um, and the main point I want to make is, without going into detail about any of this, that there's a compared to what argument. Yes, risk assessment instruments can be affected by structural racism. But what are we going to do if we don't use them? We're going to use human beings. And I'm not going to say more than this, that human beings are horrible when it comes to being unbiased for all sorts of reasons um, that I'm sure you're familiar with. And at least an algorithm has on its face the kinds of risk factors that are being used. It's very difficult uh, in contrast to figure out what a human is relying on when a human assesses risk. And in fact, Scheme and Lowenkamp and various other people have come up with a number of other ways of trying to reduce bias when a risk assessment instrument is the focus of the analysis. And this is basically summarizing the compared to what argument. Biased algorithms are easier so, um, to than biased people. Yeah. I just wanted to let you know that I did. I just wanted to let you know that we received your pharmacy records and we will- put You received what? We will call. Um, I, I, uh, I Chris, I think that she just needs to be muted. Oh, okay. There we go. Okay, good. Okay, so- um, I want to talk briefly about the retributive justice issue. I'll tell you what, I'm, I think I'm going to skip this. I will just tell you what the issue is, and then you can contemplate whether it's something we need to worry about. The basic idea is that some risk factors, in fact, most risk factors, are not factors that have to do with criminally blameworthy conduct. And some people, like Andrew Von Hirsch, who I mentioned before, thinks that's immoral. That if a risk factor is not based on criminally blameworthy conduct, it should not be the basis for anything we do to a person in the criminal justice system. After all, it's the criminal justice system, we should only do things to people that are based on criminal conduct. Okay, that's his argument. Um, one possible problem with that is that it would basically destroy REIs as we know them. Here's the VRAG again. And two thirds of the points that are available on the VRAG have nothing to do with criminal history, even broadly defined. They have to do with diagnosis, age, and things like that. We couldn't use any of those if we adopted von Hirsch's approach. So for instance, if you had a, a young male uh, with psychopathic tendencies, and you compare that person to an older woman with schizophrenia, and they both have committed the same offense, but that's all they've done, von Hirsch would say they have the same risk. Why? You can only look at criminal history and they committed the same offense. That's all you can look at. But if you use the VRAG, the psychopathy and the youth and the maleness of the first individual would make that person a lot higher risk than the, the older age and the gender of and the diagnosis of the second person. But that wouldn't matter in von Hirsch's regime. So we'd get much less accuracy and uh, by the way, also egalitarian injustice, because women and older people would be given risk scores they don't deserve. Um, and I think that's all I'm going to say about the retributive justice point. I want to end by talking about procedural justice, which concerns a lot of people, and I think rightly so, that, hey, you use algorithms, and it's basically converting people to numbers. And that's not what we should be doing, at least in the criminal justice system. Maybe for insurance purposes, no problem. But not when we're talking about criminal justice. Um, so I think there are responses to this. I just want to give you three very quickly. Uh, one is that we need to make sure that any risk assessment is transparent. I mentioned the compass before and the fact that the company that developed the compass will not tell us what the risk factors are 
or the weights given those risk factors. They claim that's protected by trade secret law. I think that should be unconstitutional if they want to use the compass in the criminal justice system. Why? Because of the right of confrontation, which is in the Sixth Amendment. People have a right to confront their accusers, and I would base that more formalistically on this case you see here, Gardner versus Florida, which basically holds what I'm arguing, that at sentencing, an individual has the right to know what the basis of the sentence is. So that would allow individuals to get a good explanation of how the evaluator arrived at the risk assessment, um, also could double check the validity of the assessment, um, make sure that race was not used, at least explicitly, um, as part of the assessment. And also, and this is maybe the most important thing, make sure um, that we know what the risk factors are. So if the judge says, okay, that's what the risk assessment says, but I'm, I'm looking at your criminal history and I'm going to adjust your risk upward because of your criminal history. Well, obviously, those of you who know risk assessment instruments know that's totally inappropriate. Why? The RAI has obviously taken criminal history into account already. That would be double counting criminal history. We need to know what the risk factors are so we can avoid that kind of adjustment. And that goes back to what I said before about why instruments, uh, the results of instruments should be dispositive and should not be adjusted most of the time. A second response to the procedural injustice point is we need to have adversarial proceedings. Right now, parole hearings at least, are often not very adversarial, but I think there's a very good constitutional argument based on the case you see here that parole hearings should be totally adversarial. It's basically the idea that risk assessments are complicated and we need to have lawyers involved to make sure that they are um, investigated appropriately. And the final response, and maybe this is the most important one, is that I think the law should require that risk assessment not only consider static factors, but dynamic factors. So as an example, the HCR 20, which as you see here highlighted in red, deals with the dynamic factors that I described earlier. And this will make clear to the individual, whatever the legal decision is, is not robotic in nature, that actually they can do something about the risk score. There are things they can do to change the risk score. And I think that's the kind of message that we need to send individuals who, whose sentences are based on risk. So I know I have talked incredibly quickly, covered a lot of complicated stuff. You're probably sitting there scratching your head, um, but I wanted to talk about it in a way that at least would raise all of the important issues the risk assessment raises. Um, here is the book again. That second uh, citation you see here is actually a much shorter version that is not argumentative, it's made uh, for it, it was written for judges who do this kind of stuff and tried to explicate some of the issues I've talked about. And then here's another article that's a shorter version of what I just got through talking about. So um, I think I've left about five minutes for yeah. questions um, and I'll stop. I think, thank you, Chris. That was terrific. We've only got a couple of minutes and there is one question in the chat that I think is a really good question. Um, isn't risk assessment are, isn't, aren't risk assessment algorithms at least as likely to increase the incarcerated population as to decrease it? Policy it all depends. To... Yeah, okay, I think that's ahead. a very good question. I think it all depends yeah. on the normative decisions made by the law. Obviously, if the law decided that any person who fits within a group 1% or more will reoffend within a five year period, yes. <laughs> if that's your definition of high risk, then everybody is going to prison, right? Um, I think on the other hand, if as I think should be the case, the law defines high risk the way I was talking about earlier. That's why I showed you that slide about the VRAG um, with all those bins. If you define high risk as a person who belongs to a group, 40% of whom or more will recidivate, you are eliminating a huge proportion of offenders from the high risk category. And I had actually an econometrician do an analysis of this on certain assumptions. And he said within 10 years, about 70% of the prison population, oh, excuse me, the prison population would be reduced by 70% within a 10 year period. If that's the way high risk was defined and we had a system that focused sentencing on risk. So it's a good question. It all depends on the normative decisions made by the law. But right now what's going on is Courts are saying, hey, 
you, if you commit an armed robbery, you get a 10-year sentence, period. With no chance of getting out except for, for good time, which is usually penny ante, number of years reduction. All right, excellent. Um, and the last, this isn't really a question, but there was an ask, if you could put that link in the chat because then people could actually click on it. Are this you, link for the primer? To do it? Yeah. Yeah, whoops. Of course, now, oh, there we go. Yeah, I can do that. Okay, that'd be- This is, a, if I can't do it for some reason, it's on the Vanderbilt website. Oh, now I get that, okay. <laughs> So it's on the Vanderbilt website. If yeah, you, but I'll get um, it. Hold if we can't get in the chat. Okay, great. And I think we're right at time. And I really, I really want to say again that that was a terrific talk. We're going to have a lot of questions in our next session. So for the fellows and the law and psychiatry people that are going to the next section, next next session, it's a different link. So we'll see you in there. And um, yeah, thank you again. And thank Tony, you. I don't know if there's yeah. anything else to say. No, just thank you. Very interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry I went through it so quickly, but hey, I had a lot to cover. Um, and that link, again, is on the Vanderbilt website. Just go to Vanderbilt. If you want to see at Vanderbilt University criminal justice program, and it's the very first thing you see uh, on the criminal justice program website. Thank you. Great. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a great rest of the day.